Hey, welcome to another weekend message. I'm Bill Thomas, pastor at Hereford Faith and Life Church. I'm really glad you came to uh, learn the Word of God, spend some time with us. Uh, I want to uh, get right into it because we're in this series on adversity, the benefits of adversity. And it almost seems, uh, you know, a, a paradox. What, what do you talk about? There's benefits to struggle. And uh, yes, there are. Uh, God uses struggle uh, many different ways uh, in our life, and we benefit uh, by growing more and more to be like Jesus. But, uh, you know, the question that I get a lot uh, is, you know, where does uh, this adversity come from? We know that uh, in God's hands, uh, God can use the struggles in our life to form the likeness of Jesus in us. And in fact, that's one of the uh, primary ways we grow and mature in the Lord. You know, yes, yeah, we grow through the word of God, absolutely, through worship, prayer, service. But one of the tools that God uses, and he'll use them all, but one of the ones he uses very skillfully is the struggles and pain, heartaches, trials and troubles that we go through uh, on this planet. And we discovered that, hey, th this is a time usually we grow the most. It's not on the mountaintops. It's in the bitter times, the, the, the times in the valleys. However, we learn from Romans chapter 8, 28, that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So what that says is that God can even take uh, the, the horrible things that we experience in our life, the struggles, the heartache, the pain. He can use every bump. He can use every obstacle as a tool in his hands to form us in the image of Jesus Christ. Now, in this message, I want to uh, lay another foundational piece of this whole uh, concept the Bible teaches about the benefits of adversity. And, you know, what we have to do uh, is talk about the origins. All right, where, where does it come from? Because there's an elephant in the room that everybody wants to address when we talk about struggles and trials. And that is this, is God the author of it all? I mean, is God the author of our struggles and our problems and our trials and our troubles? Does God deal out uh, blessings to some and, and cancer to others like a deck of cards? Does he send sickness and problems and disasters our way to, to deal with? I mean, how many times have you heard this cliche, God only puts on you what you can bear? Well, listen, that's just not true. That statement isn't anywhere in the scripture and God never, never tempts anyone, nor will he allow you to be tempted beyond your capacity. He always provides a way out, a way to escape, but we need to establish this truth right at the very beginning, and that is this. God is not the author of adversity. Why don't you say that out loud, especially if you're with people around you. God is not the author of adversity. In fact, uh, James chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, read it with me. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Listen, I love the way the New Living Translation puts that last part. It says, whatever is good and perfect comes to us from God above, who created all heaven's lights. Unlike them, he never changes or casts shifting shadow. So what God reveals about himself is that he is good and perfect all the time. He never changes. And because he never changes, that means the only thing that comes from his hand to us is good, blessing, perfect. Do you remember studying mythology in high school and uh, you learn some of the Greek and Roman gods, and and they, they these so called gods they just love to stick it to human beings, you know, and and see uh, you know, how they reacted. The, the human race was like a a chessboard. And listen, uh, the only true God, our Father in heaven, bears no resemblance to those mythological gods at all. Our God is the source of all this good and holy and pure. Even in the midst of sorrow and pain and trials and problems, he is good. He is never the author of suffering and pain, what you're going through. Instead, he is your resource. He's your strength. He's your hope, your helper, your comforter, your redeemer, your savior, your friend, your God. That's who he is. Jesus declared in John chapter 10, 11, I have come 
that they might have life and they may have it more abundantly. That's the heart of God. That's God's heart. You know, at the height of World War II in London, England, whole neighborhoods and communities were being bombed relentlessly by the Nazi Germans and uncountable numbers of buildings and, and thousands of people, civilians mostly, were killed. Survivors were left to ask, how can this destruction be part of God's will? God's plan? What is God's will for all this? Well, after City Temple in London was reduced to rubble, their pastor, Reverend Leslie Weatherhood, crafted five sermons that focused on the will of God to help his congregation endure this religious doubt they were wrestling with, and all the people of their city, with their church and their city, crumbled around him. Now, Weatherhood's five sermons were eventually published as a book called The Will of God, and uh, it's a resource that has sold more than a million copies and has been a lifeline for grieving persons seeking to understand God's purpose for their pain. I really recommend it to you if you haven't read it. But in this book, Wesley Leatherhead uh, likens God's will. Uh, I, I like it to, to a target. Uh, uh, there's a bullseye. There's two outer rings. Wesley, or uh, yeah, uh, Leatherhead uh, calls uh, this outer ring God's intentional will. This is important. This is what God intends, his desires for all the human race. For instance, the Bible is very clear. It's God's desire and intention that all people, everyone be saved. Not one human soul lost to an eternity in hell. Now that's God's intention. That people live uh, in love and harmony. That's another thing. God in, uh, intends every marriage to be a lifelong uh, uh, marriage with with harmony and love. God's intention is that his people live holy lives and always for good. God's intention is for peace on earth, goodwill toward men. But we know not every person will be saved. There are many who reject Jesus Christ. They turn their back on God. And we see the devastation of wars and disease and injustice. And this is the second ring. This is the, the one where the troubles are. Whether ahead calls this the permissive will of God. This is where God's great gift to humanity is freedom of choice. It allows the human race to experience the consequences of our poor choices and decisions or the blessings of our good ones. But because of humankind's free will, see, we can choose to drink and drive. Uh, we can choose to try heroin. We can choose to reject Christ and his claims on our lives. See, God's permissive will allows for the storms and hurricanes and floods because of the thousands of years of humanity's sin that has accumulated in our environment. It was not part of God's intention. It was not part of God's original creation or plan, but came only after the fall of the human race. That's God's permissive will. And then the bullseye, that's what... what uh, Weatherhead called the ultimate will of God. And that's the will of God that will never change or be altered, no matter what humans do or don't do, because it's the eternal plan and will of God. I think the best book to understand the ultimate will of God is the book of Revelation. We know Jesus will return. The earth and sky will melt away. God will create a new heaven and earth. The redeemed of the Lord will live forever with him. Nothing can alter or change the ultimate will of God. So, understanding that, where does the adversity come from? It's not coming from God. It, uh, he allows it in his permissive will, but where does it come from? Well, Paul in the second chapter of Ephesians describes the three origins of adversity that we face. Let's read it together. It says, once you were dead, doomed forever because of your many sins, you used to live just like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan, the mighty prince of the power of the air. He's the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passions and desires of our evil nature. We were born with an evil nature, and we are under God's anger, just like everyone else. And then it reads, but God is so rich in mercy that he loves us so very much that even while we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Jesus from the dead. It is only by God's special favor, that's a, a translation of the word grace, that you've been saved. 
For he's raised us from the dead along with Christ, and we're seated with him in the heavenly realms, all because we're one with Christ Jesus. And so God can always point to us as examples of incredible wealth, the incredible wealth of his favor, his grace, and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us through Jesus Christ. So let's bounce back and let's take a look at these three sources. All right. Read it again. Once you are dead, doomed forever because of your many sins, you used to live just like the rest of the world. There's a cause of adversity. Not talking about the physical earth, but this world system full of sin. Obeying Satan. Satan. There's the second source of adversity, the mighty prince of the power of the air. He's the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And all of us live that way, following the passion desires of what? our evil nature. There's the third source. We have the world, we have Satan, and our flesh, what the Bible calls flesh, our evil nature. And in the next weeks, what we're going to do is take a look at each one of them, how we uh, understand uh, how that adversity happens and how we can combat it, right? How can we rise above it? So today we're going to look at the world, all right? The adversity that comes from the world. We live in a fallen world, with a fallen people. Romans chapter 1, verse 8, uh, 18 through 25. Let's read it with me. From the time the world's created, people have seen the earth and sky and all that God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse whatsoever for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. The result was that their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they became utter fools instead. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people or birds or animals and snakes. So God let them go ahead and do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. You see, the world was created perfect. That was God's intentional will, that we would live in this paradise. But then mankind rebelled. They rebelled against God. They corrupted everything. Everything was sin. In fact, uh, we can see here the, the permissive will of God, where people reject God, where they, they bring adversity and troubles where, wherever they go, drunk drivers, murders, crime, immorality, perversion. Even the earth itself was corrupted by our sin. Romans 8, 19, read this with me. For all creation is eagerly awaiting for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, everything on earth was subjected to God's curse. See, this is God's permissive will. We did this to the earth. And now this world is a source of struggle, is a source of chaos, is a source of trials. All creation anticipates the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. For even the earth was itself, listen, it was corrupted uh, by our sin. And, that, and that, that's astounding, isn't it? And, and from this world and this worldly culture of the people, uh, we have an amazing source of struggle and trial. And again, uh, we're not talking about the concept here of the physical earth. We're talking about uh, the world systems, the systems of evil uh, culture. It, it, it doesn't take a rocket science to discover the ways this world directly are directly opposite and, uh, and antithetical to the kingdom of God. For instance, the world says, grab all you can, right? Grab all you can. The kingdom of God says, give all you have. <laughs> the world says, save your life. And the kingdom of God says, lay down your life for others. The world says, eat, drink, and be merry. Live for today. And the kingdom of God says, live for eternity. The world says, be first. The kingdom of God see, says, be last and servant of all. The world says, money, position, power are the marks of success. And the kingdom of God says, the character of Christ is success. See, if you're a believer, you, you are constantly bombarded with the values and the passions of this world. You're daily swimming upstream against a raging current and the flow of many people swimming the opposite direction against you. And that's hard. That brings a lot of pain and struggle and adversity into your life. 
everything from not being invited to the office party because you're no fun to be around because you won't get slobbering drunk and and sleep with everybody. Look, to the extreme of being persecuted and killed for your faith, a martyr. So let's be real here. Being a Christian in this fallen world is tough. Being a follower of Jesus Christ does not insulate us from the pain and adversity of this world. So how do we face the adversities that come? How do we rise above it? How do we get through it without being dragged down into it? Well, first, we keep our eyes and heart firmly fixed on Jesus Christ. Just as uh, you know, Jesus had fed thousands uh, with just some bread and some fish, he sent his disciples to cross the Sea of Galilee, and he went up in the hills to pray. A storm comes up. Disciples are afraid. Let me read it to you out of Matthew chapter 14. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen. They were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him, they screamed in terror, thinking it was a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. It's all right, he said. I'm here. Don't be afraid. Then Peter called out to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you by walking on the water. All right, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he looked around at the high waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Instantly, Jesus reached out his hand and grabbed him. You don't have much faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back in the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. Hey, listen, Peter was doing it. He was walking on the stormy waters until he took his eyes off Jesus and began to focus on the storm. And when he focused on the waves and the wind, fear gripped his heart. And fear is the opposite of faith, the opposite of trust. And he began to sink. Listen, when the storms and gales of this world assault us, we need to fix our eyes and our heart on Jesus Christ. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other in faith. You see, when adversity comes from the world, don't be afraid. This is common to all who live in a fallen world amidst the fallen people. What we do is to keep our focus, keep our eyes and heart fixed on Jesus and believe. Trust in him, him alone. He will see us through. He'll reach out and grab us. Listen, he'll either calm the storm or he'll calm the storm in you. But either way, you are going to make it through. Near the end of his ministry, Jesus gathered his disciples and began to prepare them for his death and all the trials and struggles and heartaches that would follow. Here's what he said. He said, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. For here in the earth, you have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. I love how Jesus doesn't mince words here. It's a fact. In this world, we will have many trials and sorrows. And we can bank on that. But he adds, take heart, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus is saying, if we keep our focus fixed upon him, if, if Christ reigns in our hearts by faith and we trust him and we put our faith in him, we too will overcome the world. Because in Jesus Christ, we are overcomers. I love this verse out of Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, peril or sword? I mean, that sounds like trials and struggles to me. As it's written, for your sake, we're killed all day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Listen, you're not just a conqueror over the trials and troubles. Lord. You are more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ. Nothing, no trial, no trouble, no struggle can take you out of his strong hands. I love the way the prophet Isaiah said it. He said, do not be afraid. I've ransomed you. I've called you by name. You're mine. When you go through deep waters and great trouble, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you'll not be burned up. The flames will not consume you for I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Have you ever heard someone uh, reply to the question, how you're doing? They say, well, pretty good under the circumstances. The question here is, what are you doing under the circumstances when in Christ you can be over your circumstances? How are you doing? Hey, it's hard, but I'm more than a conqueror 
in Jesus Christ. Because of him, I'm going to get through this. Because in him, I'm more than a conqueror. We should get used to saying that when we walk through deep waters. The second thing we need to do when we're facing the adversities of this world is stay connected to the body of Christ. You know, unfortunately, one of the first things Christians tend, seem to tend to do when, when adversity strikes is we disconnect from the church. We disconnect from worship. We, we disconnect from our small groups. We even sometimes disconnect from God. The Bible is very clear. The Christian life is not a solitary life. You're not to be in this world trying to make it alone. You'll never make it. But the life of a disciple, the follower of Christ, is always lived out in community. The body of Christ, your church family, there are no lone rangers. We're to be joined together like a chain, each one of us a link, keeping the other strong through thick and thin. We're in this journey together. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul put it this way, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up only one body. So it is with the body of Christ. If one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts are glad. Now, all of you together are Christ's body. Each one of you is a separate and necessary part of it. Stay connected. In the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, it says two people can accomplish more than twice as much as one. They get a better return for their labor. If one person falls, the other can reach out for help. The people who are alone when they fall are in real trouble. Amen. Isn't that true? And on a cold night, two under the same blanket can gain warmth from each other. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. I tell you, that's an important understanding that when tr trials and adversity comes, we don't run, we don't hide. We call our family together. And remember a, a couple weeks ago, I said together, together, we run farther, faster, and funner with others. We all need running partners in our race with Jesus Christ, right? To grow in him. The third thing we need to do when we face these trials and struggles, adversities in the world is understand this. This world is not our home. We, we need to embrace this truth and live this truth. In fact, if you're with somebody, just turn and say, you know, the world is not my home. Go ahead. The world is not my home. This, this world system is not our home. If you're in Jesus Christ, our home is in heaven. Jesus said, though I am in this world, I am not of this world. I live on this planet, but listen, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. Heaven is our home. We're in the world, but not of the world. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Listen, this world's not our home. We're, we're pilgrims. We're travelers. The Bible sometimes uses the word even aliens. We're on this planet because this isn't our home. Heaven is where we live. Heaven is our home. Jesus on the night, just moments before his arrest and his suffering began, he was participating in the uh, celebration of the Passover meal in the upper room, and he prayed for his disciples. He prayed for us. Let's read this prayer together. Jesus says, and now I'm coming to you. I've told them many things while I was with them, so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word. And look at the world hates them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They are not part of this world any more than I am. Make them pure and holy by teaching them your words of truth. And as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. And I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me because of their testimony. <laughs> you know, the, the, the things of this world can be so attractive and seductive. A, a bigger house, a, a newer car, more stuff, more things. Rise to the top, get the office with the nice window view, the great parking place. It, it's all important, but listen, is that really living? That's all an illusion. It's all a terrible fake. Why? Because it doesn't last. It's not eternal. The things of this world will rust, rot, and decay and disappear, be spent, be emptied. It doesn't last. 
And many will spend their lives for things in this world that the world deems valuable, but God does not. It doesn't matter at all. Jesus said, you know, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but loses his soul in the process? And you and I know if you ever purchased a new car, remember your first ding? <laughs> like, you know, you feel the pain, don't you? The things of this world are temporary at best, and they are not worth our eternal soul. I saw that you can even buy new car spray that you can spray, you know, and make make it smell new and keep it new. But, you know, just a couple of trips to McDonald's with your kids, it's gone. That car has a whole different fragrance, doesn't it? And we can apply oil of old age on our face. We can put on wrinkle remover and a gazillion beauty products. But folks, listen, uh, these bodies of ours are on borrowed time. They're just earth tents that house the true inner beauty of our spirit made in the image of God. Generations ago, an elderly missionary couple was returning home after 50 years of sharing Christ and caring for the people in a small rural village in the jungles of Africa. They were on an ocean liner making its way to New York. And on this voyage was a high-ranking dignitary who was returning from a visit to Africa. And when they arrived in the New York Harbor, there was a spectacular display of water jets and marching bands, dignitaries to welcome him back to America. And when all the fanfare ended and the passengers disembarked, the couple began to walk with their bags to their hotel. The husband, saddened and disheartened, remarked to his wife, Honey, we've spent the best years of our lives serving God in the most remote place in the earth, and yet there's no fanfare for us. No celebration that we've arrived, not one person to welcome us home. And his wife looked up at him with great admiration and pride, squeezed his hand and replied, Honey, that's because we're not home yet. This world isn't our home. That's why we can turn our backs on the glitz and the glamour and all this stuff. And we can freely and sacrificially give of our lives for the sake of Jesus. We can do that because we know our home is waiting for us. Jesus himself said he's making a special place for us there. And when it's time to come home, he will come and take us. And all of heaven will welcome us with a celebration unlike anything this world could imagine. So when you're struggling, when the adversity and trials are coming from this world system, keep your eyes focused on Jesus Christ because in him you're more than a conqueror. Stay connected to your church family, the body of Christ. Don't drift, don't run. Get help from your brothers and sisters. And thirdly, remember, no matter what, this world is not your home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you, God, that in the midst of trials and tribulations, you said you will never leave us or forsake us that you are always with us. So Lord, help us keep our focus, our eyes on you, realizing that in you, we are more than conquerors. Lord, help us to stay connected with our church family, stay connected with our brothers and sisters in Christ. There's strength and power in that family that we need in these trials and struggles. And Lord, <laughs> this world's not my home. I know my home's with you in heaven. And I look forward to that day. That day when my assignment here is done and you call me home, what a fanfare and celebration that will be. And I thank you for that. I ask your blessings and all the people listening, all their families and loved ones, those who have uh, financial need, those who are struggling with health issues, those who are struggling with relational issues. God, you are present right now in that situation. Release your grace and your mercy and do miracles in our lives, we pray. And we give you all the honor and the glory. It's yours, Lord Jesus. We thank you. Thank you for our new life in you because of the cross. You died for us in our place. God, we, we just live every day with a grateful heart. No matter what we're struggling with, it's nothing compared to what you went through on the cross for us. Lord, keep us strong. Build our faith in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Well, I'm glad you spent this time with us. I hope you took some good notes. And uh, if you're not uh, going through struggles right now, you can use those notes to help somebody else. But I can guarantee 
if you're still living on planet Earth, the world is going to be a place of trial. So be ready and be prepared. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Stay connected. And remember, this world's not your home. Well, the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Go now, be the hands and feet of Christ in your world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen and amen. Well, God bless you, and I'm glad that you spent this time with me.